no one reads terms and conditions like mm. it, or disclaimers at all. You can't expect a user who needs a service uh, in 15 minutes from now, creating an account, that he will read 30,000, 50,000 words in, in that particular moment. Yeah, for sure. You actually need to understand how users behave and, and track that uh, behavior. has become the new norm. Cafes and shops are vacant. They've obviously shut down about half the U.S. Yeah. economy. Not only are stocks going down, gold is going down, credit's going down. At this point, uh, it's clear that we are going to have a recession that's more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain ways across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And we are here at the Crypto Compare Digital Asset Summit 2020 with tons of exciting guests and ready to edutain you with timeless interviews. And I'm very, very happy today to say that we have Stani Kulichov, founder of Ave, one of the exciting projects in DeFi. Stani. Glad to have you here Thanks today. Thanks for having me and uh, going to tell something no BS about DeFi. Yeah, yeah, please keep it no BS. That would be absolutely <laughs> amazing. But first off, Stanley, which is really interesting is you kicked off an engineering software mm. development and you did a little bit of legal law mm. studies. Yeah. What really made you passionate about this space and think DeFi is for me? <laughs> yeah, I think like funny part, like when we started back in a few years ago, uh, there wasn't like DeFi as, as a kind of like a as a buzzword or as a space. We just were basically uh, using smart contracts to develop different kinds of financial products and, and protocols. And our previous product, uh, which was EatLend, was basically the first lending protocol in Ethereum. And we just basically, we were passionate about finance uh, and uh, basically wanted to create something uh, very interesting, like uh, trustless, transparent way to uh, let other people to interact. And that's how kind of got us into the space. and. Uh, uh, by the time the space developed a bit, we got stable coins, liquidity pools, and uh, and then basically, uh, voila, you had DeFi. <laughs> yeah. You were a real visionary because lending, you were ahead of the curve. Yeah. Now in 2020, lending is one of the biggest topics yeah. across the crypto space. Why did you think lending had so much potential back in those days? What was your vision at the time? The interesting part is like now, like the lending space, as you said, is very interesting. There's like very uh, interesting lending protocols. And, and like, I really admire where we are at this point uh, the, as a whole, like a community in DeFi, uh, especially in, uh, now in Ethereum, there's the most liquidity at the moment. Uh, what's interesting, like back in the days, uh, we started uh, kind of like before the stable coins where and back then lending was very difficult because uh, you weren't uh, borrowing like a stable asset. So you had to do different kinds of hedging and that wasn't very liquid. And once the stable coins came out and, and basically, uh, especially like DAI and now USDT into the uh, ERC20 uh, format and, and USDC as well from, from Coinbase, what it allowed to basically do is that DeFi now growth where it is because uh, instead of holding US dollars in your account or an other fiat currency, you get like uh, much better yields from the DeFi space. And that's what attracts people uh, in, in the first place, the yields. And of course, the technology serves uh, to make like uh, trustless transactions is even more fascinating. That's really cool. And that being that transition for people who want to earn interest, mm -hmm. do you think that that is one of the best stepping stones to mass adoption as of today? I, I think kind of like uh, it's one of the kind of maybe like not the best, but I would say it's uh, the easiest way. Easiest. When people yeah. see like basically you can earn better yields at, at DeFi and momentarily. 
uh, especially when the protocols mature, assets mature it would, against some assets that you are actually borrowing and, and lending out some stable coins, the yields might not be in the future so, so uh, high. But <clears throat> that's kind of like a one way to get more people interested and, and seeing like a bit more curious, like how is this happening? Why is this happening? Yeah. And that brings people into the space. But definitely once that we're past that stage, and I think that people can see like how you can build different kinds of things in, in, in the DeFi ecosystem. For example, you can uh, utilize Aave Flash loans to, to uh, for example, close your MakerDAO CDP and refinance your loan to other lending protocol. Here's a small like composability trick. And when you have tons of different kinds of uh, tools like this, that will basically fascinate people because the money moves very programmatically and mm -hmm. that has never happened before so freely. I would love to ask you more about the flash loans, but you gave me an idea of a question. Mm -hmm. As of today, if I put my money in a savings account with mm -hmm. any bank, usually you get less than 1% in yes. terms of the, the earnings. DeFi has some programs that go all the way up to 15%. Now, yes. is this realistic or is there any risk behind it? Do you have any advice for those platforms offering crazy like interest exactly like the thing like what i love about to talk most is is the risk because like these different uh DeFi protocols and and especially when you go multiple layers in the composability uh you have like uh kind of like piled up risk and what is interesting like uh in one way because the the network effect in in decentralized finance is is pretty much the liquidity mm -hmm. and to get liquidity you need to hack that liquidity so we i, I call it basically yield hacking so when, when different protocols or, or um, different kinds of um, algorithms are doing this yield hacking, uh, they're either taking more risk or are, are using techniques that take, for example, market risk and, and basically providing more yield. I definitely think like the, the very base layer protocols in terms of lending, uh, the yields might go down at some point unless you introduce a bit of uh, riskier assets. And by riskier, you don't need to go all the way down to the risk rabbit hole, but basically slightly more risk. And I, I just think like yield hacking is part of the space and, 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 and we will see like a lot of interesting yield opportunities. But also I think the problematic part in DeFi now is that uh, we don't disclose, disclose the risk that we have very well for the end user. And I think that's problematic now. That's really interesting. So you believe like the 15 or 12% is kind of like <clears throat> yield hacking, but it will definitely scale back a little yeah, bit as we move forward. Definitely. Because there will be more competition on the same particular level. For example, uh, we compete with different lending protocols and kind of not just compete, but we complement each other. So we might have a uh, protocol on top of us that actually uses our protocol and, and basically uh, other lending protocols, which is pretty cool uh, in terms of composability. And, and the capital allocation will move pretty quickly. So let's say if we have even 2% better yields than other lending protocols, uh, the capital will move quickly algorithmically in the future to our protocol. And if uh, some other protocol will have the same, it moves there. So we, we definitely are not there yet in terms of algorithmic uh, uh, capital allocation, but we are definitely going towards that uh, uh, kind of like a path. That's very exciting. So you were saying that there's a lack, a little bit of transparency on how the, the funds or the risk is being managed. Yeah. Like how do some of these lending platforms actually make money through this yeah. system these days? So uh, touching based on the transparency thing, I think like the coolest part on Ethereum uh, and the Ethereum specific like uh, DeFi ecosystem is that everything is like uh, auditable by anyone. So all their interest rates transactions are seen in the uh, public blockchain ledger and that's very cool. At some point, there will be some privacy as well introduced, but uh, like I think at this point, it's it's important for everyone to see what's happening, you know. Uh, but in terms of like uh, uh, risks, like you could see everything and and you understand like how things are work. You see the code, how the code executes, but not many people understand code. That's the thing. Like it's the technical people, and retail people or institutions who are depositing, uh, they might not have the the technical capabilities of assessing uh, the code, so they need to trust someone and that someone might be smart contract auditors or the, the peer community. And in terms of like how uh, the meditation works in DeFi, that is like very cryptic thing because like we've seen protocols that are not implementing any monetization. We have communities that think you should not monetize because uh, uh, you're basically uh, creating a system where you have less friction and you're not running the bank infrastructure so you, you should monetize as least as possible. Uh, and I think that's BS yeah. because like you should monetize as, as much as you're providing value to your end users. Absolutely. The more you provide value, the more you can actually monetize. And that's part of the yield hacking. If you can hack more yield to your, your end users, 
the more you can actually monetize. And I think that's the way to do it. Absolutely. And if you want to scale your technology mm. and offer even more futures, there mm. has to be monetization somewhere, right? Exactly. So. Because like the, the thing that people forget is that uh, all these protocols, they're basically uh, built by someone. And in the future, there might not be a development team that is building, but I actually a community. And for example, at Aave, we're, we're basically a small team building things. We, we have a... Uh, we, we focus a lot of on security. Uh, we have now basically half a million uh, budget into smart contract audits and uh, formal verifications and whatnot. And the important part is to realize that there is so much that goes into making a good and secure protocol that basically it's, it, you have to find some way to sustain. Yeah. And if you provide that value added to your end user, it's very fine to monetize. Uh, but of course, the interesting part is when uh, you have a governance open source protocol, you are actually able to uh, spread that uh, kind of like uh, monetization to the whole community if you have, for example, some sort of economics involved in governance. So that's a pretty cool thing. That's really cool. And, you know, the, obviously lending and earning interest and this whole mm. savings account thing is something that you saw way ahead of this DeFi movement. Mm. And it's definitely probably besides stable coins or they're the most discussed yeah. topics in DeFi, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, stable coins are a very, very awesome thing. Like one of the things I, for example, lo lo love about like, uh, DAI is it's, it's basically decentralized stable coin and it's kind of like a, a bit of algorithmic based and, and basically it, it really uh, provides the ability to, to use a, a stable value within the DeFi ecosystem. Then we have stable coins for example like USDT and, and, and basically USDC which are basically using uh, tokenization in a way to provide more liquidity into the DeFi space which is totally fine because like uh, the more liquidity you have the more actually like composability and more um, traction you will actually have within the uh, blockchain, blockchain ecosystem. So you're not one of those guys who's thinking only decentralized versus mm. centralized or traditional finance versus crypto finance. Mm. You, you're not one of the guys who chooses only one side. You like to see... Uh... Well, the thing is like in terms of like a protocol, what we're building, um, our path is, is, is to decentralize as much as possible. So basically, because we have an open source protocol, that basically means that we want to give... Uh, the governance of the protocol completely to the community, which means that basically with a with a token you can actually govern the protocol. Uh, what kind of assets could be added in the future? Uh, what kind of lending parameters there will be, and 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 maybe some sort of like insurance like uh, features. And that's like that's basically our path. But if you're building DeFi products, uh, it doesn't basically mean that uh, you will have you will need the similar amount of mm -hmm. decentralization. It really depends on what layer you're operating yeah. and who is basically the your end user. For us, it's important the, the 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 kind of like a journey and being higher level of the uh, DeFi spectrum because basically we are infrastructure provider, and when it's, we're building something very important, those things usually tend to be open source when done done well. Linux, for example. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So the layer, the protocol layer, needs to be decentralized, and what goes on top yeah. doesn't really. Yeah. Uh, exactly. that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I have a quick question because you're just talking about decentralization, and I saw your hands doing this. Yes. So do you see decentralization more as different levels whether than yes or no? Or? Exactly. So there's two things. Uh, first is like decentralization is a spectrum. So you, it depends on what you're building. Uh, it defines like how much you need decentralization. And second thing is that uh, decentralization is a journey. So you could be very decentralized from the day one. But then if you have some sort of like a box or you want to improve your protocol for uh, to optimize it for your end users, it's very difficult to do if, if basically you can't make quick changes. Uh, and that's why basically the decentralization, it's not just a binary thing on and off, but also it's a journey. So uh, to get where you need to be, it takes a bit of time and it takes like different kinds of steps. But the, the very important part is that you have clear plan, what you're going to do and how decentralized you're going to be, because that's an important thing that the community values. That's really good. So you're always transparent no matter what level of decentralization and make sure yes. that they know where you're going. Exactly. The tr tr transparency is, is the key here. Is the key here. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so obviously DeFi is a massive phenomenon and, and Ave has been one of you know the, the flag holders of mm -hmm. this movement. Um, but as you know, in every movement, there are always people who try to take mm -hmm. advantage, you know, of maybe the marketing or mm -hmm. the cool, you know, factor of being a part of the DeFi. Yeah. Like definitely. what are what are some of the uh, you obviously you said lending was great, stable coins are awesome. We haven't talked about decentralized exchanges yet, but there are also other projects trying to take advantage of this branding. Mm -hmm. Do you see some use cases that do not necessarily need DeFi as of today? Uh, definitely, I, I think like uh, I used to call this uh, this kind of like terminology in terms of terminology like uh, DeFi as marketing. 
So, so basically, if you plug in kind of like your system into DeFi, it doesn't mean that you're DeFi, but you're doing good thing because you're you're basically providing liquidity into the DeFi space, and you're providing experiences, and you don't need to be completely decentralized. But for example, uh, gateways and and uh, centralized exchange are a good example where you might have more robustness in trading and and basically onboard more people into the crypto space as a as a kind of like a bigger concept, and then you can plug into like uh, into the DeFi, for example, when you want to. Uh, get people uh, yields. For example, if you're an exchange, you can plug into Aave and get those yields into your end users, basically, and minimize their trading fees and and what costs and whatnot. And that's like the the interesting part. So like the DeFi is one ecosystem. <clears throat> there's bigger ecosystems. There's basically the crypto ecosystem. There's the fintech ecosystem, uh, finance ecosystem, and 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 so forth. So there's different kind of layers, and 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 basically, uh, it really depends on what you're operating in. Mm, that's really, really well put. And talking about fiat gateways, when it comes to the DEX versus the centralized mm-hmm. system, um, what, what are the pros and cons? Or how do you see it as of today? Kyber Network has been yeah. doing really well. Oh, yeah. Uniswap has been gaining crazy uh, traction sure. as well. Well, is this really growing? Is this where we're going? Is that the future for you? Or? Yeah, I, like, that, that's the crazy thing. Like I expect I've, I've been following uh, basically the DEX scene. Uh, Already, like the first DEX I, I, I got excited was Ether Delta. Yeah, Ether Delta. I, yeah. I think it was actually the very first DEX. It, when it started, uh, I, I think like a couple of weeks ago uh, after the launch, I tried to sell my. I used to have like a tokens of uh, first blood tokens, and I tried to put a sell order or a buy order. It took like a one week that to get filled. So the liquidity wasn't there, and it, it took a bit time of, of uh, the liquidity to form up. And what is interesting now in the, the deck scene is that uh, we don't have this order matching only, but we have like the pool modeling. The same with what happened with lending, for example, and that provides more liquidity. And now that the liquidity is available and pooled ready, you can basically use it in different compatibility functions. And that's why the DEXs are growing, because there are hundreds of developers using Aave, using Kyber, using Uniswap, and, and just building things that are actually, and then of course, a bunch of other called DeFi uh, uh, protocols and products and building this kind of things. And all that uh, kind of like usage of liquidity will just grow uh, the, the DEXs and liquidity pools like Uniswap and Kyber. And I'm personally like super excited to see that grow because like I'm firm believe in DEXs and it's such a simple transactions so that like if you go to now to, to like Binance, which, which is a, a very good centralized exchange in terms of like user experience and you go Uniswap, and try different, like which is easier to use. Like many times you hear that Uniswap is easier and that's a basically DEX liquidity pool. So like we don't anymore have this kind of like user experience issue in, in, in DeFi space. I mean, uh, Aave is very easy to use, to be honest. Um, yeah, Uniswap really nice. is easy, Kyber nice. is easy and, and the things that people are building on top is, is pretty easy to use. I think it's now just a time that actually people realize that how cool the space is, how much things are evolving and, and it just will grow exponentially. And I'm, I'm super excited about this. That's fascinating. And a lot of people say, and obviously the ERC-20 or the Ethereum decentralized exchanges are the ones that are basically doing really well and mm. other ones are still being developed mm. and improving, of course, day by day. Um, in terms of, of that outlook and in terms of atomic swaps, mm. so if I want to be able to send you an Ethereum token and you mm. want to send back an EOS or another blockchain yeah. token, realistically, how mm. far are we uh, in terms of being able to actually do that type of cross-chain, like in, in terms so. of like uh, when how far I, I would say like in volume wise and and and, and scalability wise, I think like in six months we'll be doing six to twelve months we're doing like very substantial volume. Maybe not six months from now, but I will say substantial volume is from eight to 12, 12 months from now, because like the the things that are now being built between the bridges, basically getting more liquidity into Ethereum. And interacting with other things and and the cool stuff that is being built, uh, for example, in Polkadot, Polkadot and so forth. I, I think like uh, we're going to see a very very big leapfrog after six months from now, and that will be like very nice to see liquidity going from one blockchain to another. Because to be honest, like <clears throat> in one way I'm, I'm a like very Ethereum maximalism maximalist, but I'm also kind of like uh, I understand that liquidity lives where it has its place, and and then I, I'm seeing that actually this liquidity could be used in other blockchains as well. And depending on what kind of security consensus algorithms they have, and that liquidity could be in other blockchains could be used in Ethereum. So it's all about liquidity end of the day. Wow, six to 12 months, so that's really soon. Yeah. It's coming really soon, that's exciting. So a lot of people are a little bit concerned about the fact that you know cross-chain, it will be slower and, and, and the fees on both sides may add yeah. up. And 
but it's hopefully in six to months to one year. I think so. I, I think like, uh, let's say from 12 months from now, it's easy to swap. Uh, what is interesting to see like being like uh, DeFi products built on, on, on basically cross blockchain. So it will be interesting to see when you can actually create a, a stable coin by collateralizing asset on, on let's say Ethereum, uh, Cosmos, uh, Polkadot and, and so forth and just kind of like in, in one place and transfer that liquidity. So, I mean, it, it's fascinating that's being built and uh, I'm pretty eager to see how things are going to evolve. That's so awesome. And you just mentioned that you were an Ethereum maximalist. I, I would love to hear more. Like, uh, what are some things, you know, last year people were really negative about Ethereum. There's a lot of negativity when, you know, obviously Ethereum 2.0 was, was postponed. Mm. But now all of a sudden through DeFi and mm. all the, the Ethereum being staked on mm. through the DeFi platforms, the sentiment has suddenly revived, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I, and for me, like the postponing of uh, E 2.0, that's that's not a like. Yeah, I will. I personally wasn't that concerned at all because I I firmly believe uh, in in a way that uh, like if you do this kind of big updates, you basically need to have very diligent pro procedure, and you should not uh, deploy anything unless you're completely uh, confident. Because like uh, the thing with Ethereum is, or or any other blockchain that has a lot of assets there is that they're used uh, substantially. And for example, the DeFi space now uh, in, in Ethereum is like uh, roughly uh, 1 billion, depending yeah. on the yeah. valuation of the assets. And what that actually says is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the these blockchains are used in very, very serious financial transactions, uh, whether we like it or not, or whether we keep call uh, this uh, blockchain protocols uh, still kind of like experimentations, mm -hmm. pioneering ships. You can't stop liquidity. It will come there. And that's why it's important to talk about risk, talk about like slow developing process, talk about security. Uh, because like even if you basically name it as a experimental uh, project called DeFi, whole uh, blockchain ecosystem or alpha or whatever, I mean, if there's liquidity, it's serious. And then the risks are serious as well. And the consequences, if things go wrong, it's good that you're always talking about risk as well, because yeah. a lot of these people, that's kind of like what they're measuring, you know, and, and whether they should get in or, mm -hmm. or not, right? They're like, how much should I put in? Is this risky? I'm not mm -hmm. too familiar. And it's scary, right, for some people. Yeah, I think the, in terms yeah. of risk, we're so early. So kind of like we're still in a stage that people are excited about yields. So basically like, hey, I'm getting like 10% 10, 10, 10 APR or 5% APR. Like this is so cool. Like I get like something like a zero from my bank or 1%. <laughs> yeah. But like the, the fact is that, uh, like for example, in Europe, the, the banks will guarantee you up to 100,000 um, euros or, or pounds or whatnot. And the interesting part is like in DeFi, like we're so excited about the yields, we definitely forget that actually there is uh, risk involved. And even if there's risk involved, let's say that uh, people understand that, okay, this is something might be more riskier. There's always that are taking that risk. So basically, it's also kind of like part of the diversification. Yeah. Like one thing I was like recommending um, in our community that if someone actually builds a kind of way to track your transactions, based on transactions, it will let you or or not let you do a Ethereum transaction. Yeah. So you could basically build a tool that tracks your previous like uh, uh, trading history or DeFi history and actually decides whether you can do this transaction or not. If, if it's too risky for you, or you're actually able to take that kind of risk based on your profile. So this kind of things we'll probably see in the future as well. That's such a good point because mm. you're right. The safer it will get, probably the less interest mm. you will get, right? So it's all yep. about risk diversification. E exactly. And... So would you still feel comfortable like if your sister or little brother came mm. over and they're like, oh, I want to put uh, money in the DeFi and then the savings program, mm. um, would you still give them a limitation on, on mm. their overall budget as of today? Or? Definitely. I mean, whatever they're investing, whether they're uh, investing in, in, in common stocks and shares or what, what will be the thing. Uh, my, my first, of course, goal is that I never try to advise yeah. on any kind of like investment because it's 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 like history has proven that yeah, doesn't work between really like uh, 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 between relatives, you know, and I don't let money to my friends or family. I just say that go to the other protocol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I, like uh, jokes apart, I, I think like, um, uh, I, I think everyone should actually understand the risk. So one of the things like initiatives we're doing now at Aave, uh, we do have a user interface so you can access like Aave through uh, my Ether wallet or different kinds of wallet that has integrated Aave. 
or basically to our uh, user interface. And one of the things we're doing in our interface, we're trying to basically uh, disclaim the risk that is involved when you basically do different kinds of transactions or when you enter the platform for your very first time. And like one of the problematic things, uh, this comes from my background uh, uh, being in law, is that uh, no one reads terms and conditions like mm. it, or disclaimers at all. Yeah, so cool. when you sign up for a service, like you never read because yeah. th the legal design is completely wrong. So you can't expect a user who needs a service uh, in 15 minutes from now that he is actually creating an account that he will read uh, basically uh, uh, 30,000, 50,000 words in, in that particular moment. Yeah, for sure. And even like bullet points. So the thing is like, it's also important to uh, design them very well that the user understands that, okay, here's the very key points of what you are going to do and how what, what kind of risk there is involved. And that's something like this kind of disclaimers that are well legally designed is, is part of what we are now actually doing. Mm -hmm. So you can't just do a terms of conditions in your user interface and expect people to re even read them. Mm -hmm. You actually need to understand how users behave and, and track that uh, behavior. That's so true though. There could, there could be a different way of presenting it mm -hmm. like through video, through checking mm -hmm. different pages and slides with, with, with mm -hmm. design and stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now there's a question that I wanted to ask you earlier. You talked about mm -hmm. flash loans. Yeah, and you touched upon it, and it's something that's so difficult to explain to people. And I know it's very hot. Yeah. Recently, there was I think someone who made one hundred fifty thousand dollars through one yeah. flash loan. Yeah. Which yeah. which was viral uh, yeah. on, on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Um, if my grandma Susie was in the room and she was like, yeah. uh, "Stanny, what is a flash loan? Yeah. How would you explain it in the most simple terms for her?" So basically, uh, in very very easy manner is is uh, to say that uh, I I would lend out. Uh, well, Susie can borrow from me a certain amount of funds, whatever I have available, and she can do all kinds of transactions. So she can uh, buy bread from uh, shop A, go to shop uh, B and sell the bread for a higher price. And that extra yield, she could uh, basically uh, buy another, let's say, like uh, item and, and sell it on another place again or whatever transactions she does. Uh, and, and basically, she can do all of these transactions. And the only condition is basically that she needs to return my loan mm -hmm. back to me. And once uh, if she doesn't return, those all the transactions that she actually did in between will basically fail. So they will not exist. And it relies upon the system that uh, Ethereum is a big settlement network. So everything is settled on each block. Whatever transactions you are doing in, in, the, in one block, uh, you have different kinds of conditions. And if you add this kind of condition and you don't fulfill it, it basically reverts the transaction. So basically, we all, even the shopkeepers, are agreed upon the settlement network. And that's why those transactions will basically get uh, canceled as well. They will not just work. So it's, it's basically uh, just one condition that if that uh, capital is not returned, all of that will basically go away. Fantastic. Is there any risk behind that uh, at the moment? Like, mm. are people mainly using it when they see like an arbitrage opportunity mm. between two things? They're like, oh, I'm going to quickly take that money. I'm going to buy here, sell here, give it back and, and take a little bit of the interest. Or Definitely arbitrage is one of the like first use cases that was like once we launched, I think it, it took like one hour or something that there was like first uh, flash loan done by the arbitrage DAO. You can do like a collateral swap. And actually today I just got a uh, uh, message from the uh, DeFi saver guys and saying that, hey, they have been uh, actually implementing flash loans and, and, and basically the implementation works as follows. So uh, the thing is when you create a um, uh, CDP vault, so when you collateralize ETH to mean DAI, and, and, and uh, let's say you spend that DAI and, and the, you want to close the CDP, but you don't have the DAI and, and, and basically the market is going down and the liquidation might happen. So what you can actually do is uh, you can take a flash loan, uh, die flash loan, close the CDP and, and, and get your collateral back basically. Mm -hmm. And what basically they did it uh, in a way that uh, you can actually do this as an end user because flash loan is kind of like a developer to, to build this kind of things. Mm -hmm. So DeFi Saver came and built a tool which uses flash loan to co close your uh, CDP without, uh, to avoid getting liquidated because when you get liquidated, uh, you lose um, part of your collateral, which is uh, roughly 13% uh, in the MakerDAO system, to the uh, uh, liquidators. So basically, when you self-liquidate yourself, what happens is that you can keep that 13%. Mm -hmm. So the money goes back to the borrower, which is pretty cool. 
Really cool. So that's, those are the savvy people who understand, you know, how to yeah. make use of the the, ecosystem. The, the, the the interesting part is that the savvy people are like uh, the DeFi savers who built this 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 awesome tool. But basically, the the people who can use it is basically just regular users like you and me. End of the day. So if you have a CDP open, uh, you can basically just click once and the liquidation happens without returning the die. So that's pretty cool. Super fascinating. Yeah. That is super cool. So I must ask you, as as one mm -hmm. of the, I would say, the father founders of this DeFi movement, you know, with Ave and all all you've done, mm -hmm. like, what do you really want to see? Tell us about 2020, 2021, and beyond, if possible. The one, one interesting thing I really want to see is, is DeFi being as DeFi. So really, I want to uh, emphasize that uh, different kinds of protocols that are there are trying to put more effort into um, Maybe not even like uh, just just becoming more decentralized, but have a clear picture and communicate it very directly uh, to the community and the whole ecosystem. Because uh, the thing is, like whatever you're building in DeFi, uh, we're part of the community, everyone. And what I would like to see is more that there's uh, more planning on what's your journey to decentralization and to what point. And and basically that will kind of like help uh, the whole ecosystem to 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 mature more. Because if we lose the perspective of uh, what, what DeFi is all about, which is basically the uh, permissionless transaction, non-custodial uh, interaction and, and transparency and whatnot, uh, we will lose the kind of like value added yeah. of DeFi. And then we will have just expensive MySQL database that runs all the transactions. And uh, that's the biggest thing I'm, I'm afraid. And besides that, the second thing, like what I'm trying to um, uh, kind of like preach is, is basically the security. And, and to emphasize as much as possible into the security and the way you have your procedures. So how you update your code, uh, what are your internal procedures, uh, disaster recovery plan, and, and, and so forth. So these things, and that's not just like something that I'm, I'm basically saying that, okay, you as a DeFi developer have to obey or something like that. It's just like us, everyone, like even Aave and every DeFi protocol that takes things seriously, uh, will have to choose this route to actually make sure that uh, they are applying the best practices that you can and, and because we all are building end of the day financial products. And if we want the space to continue to grow, we just have to make sure that we're using the best tools available and putting all the effort we can to protect our users' money. And that's important for us. That's really important. And so in terms of mass adoption, and I know mm. you've been asked this question on multiple panels, yeah. you know, and, and I like how you're know, humble and you're obviously you're very enthusiastic, but you're also very realistic, which is great. Mm. Uh, can you tell us, Danny, like, how far are we from being able to have mass adoption on DeFi mm. platforms? And when do you see like the, that, that curve, the, mm. the crossing the chasm, as we say? That's interesting because I, I think it, it, it will happen in different layers. So they, basically there will be at some point a uh, lot of inter institutional interest. But before we get into that state, one of the things is that we have to kind of understand is, is how we are able to measure the risk. Because the, the better we are able to measure the risk and calculate the risk and present it to the uh, uh, bigger public, the more mass adoption we yeah. will get. Because then we'll get institutions, uh, institutions involved in the DeFi and basically hedge funds and, and uh, other financial institutions, which basically opens uh, a bit more the, the kind of like uh, floodgate to retailers. Because now pretty much the, the kind of retailer in DeFi is a nerd with technical skills. Yeah. But you can't scale that because there are, aren't that many nerds and yeah. <laughs> in the planet and, and not everyone is a nerd, right? Yeah. And to get like uh, more people, uh, nerds like us, we build protocols and, and other nerds are building basically uh, ways to interact with the protocols easier. But also we need the financial institutionals to kind of like recognize uh, the benefits, understand the, the ris risks and how to measure them and, and basically understand how to participate. Once we achieve that, I think we'll get uh, a pretty good adoption. And I think it will take like five years from now. That's really good. That's so important. So measuring the risk, mm. understanding, communicating the risk, and then so that the institutional guys come in, mm. and then that will give more liquidity for the retail. Exactly. And it just it creates an entire ecosystem for exactly. everybody. Oh, cool. Five years. Well, I'm keeping my fingers <laughs> crossed yeah. because this is definitely, I mean, it, in terms of, you know, ethos, in terms of philosophy, yeah. it, it makes sense. I yep. mean, this is what Bitcoin has given us. So Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. So uh, the, the mother of all this uh, movement. Uh, well, yeah, thank you. Here. <laughs> yeah, right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I think she's red. She's red right yeah. now. <laughs> the, it's very hot with the fire. But nice. thank you so much, Stanny. So like, uh, if we want to follow you or mm. get in touch with you, what are mm. the, the best ways to... Uh, 
Uh, it really depends on what your uh, aim is. The easiest way to follow is us in, in Twitter. It's basically Abe Abe, uh, the, the handle. Uh, if you are very interested in what you're doing, uh, join our like Telegram, which is basically Abe Som. Awesome. Oh, yeah. nice. And then we have Discord, Abe.com uh, slash Discord. And I, I think Discord is the very best place to interact directly with, with, the, with the team. And if you're building something especially, if you're a developer, uh, go to developers.ave.com uh, and there's super cool stuff. You could actually do your first flash loan or nice. <clears throat> build a product for your end users uh, with flash loans. Yeah. Super cool. We'll, we'll put all the links in the description below. Thank you cool. so much for coming today. Thank it was, so it was a pleasure to have you, Sunny. And guys, if you have any comments, opinions, ideas about the future of DeFi, do you like flash loans? What about decentralized exchanges? All the topics we had today, the more perspectives you can put in the comments box, the more we can learn as a community. So it's really important that you share, put your comments below, like and subscribe, of course, and blast that bell notification so that you can get access to all these cool people, their insights and ideas. See you guys next week, every Wednesday, premiering at 8 o'clock GMT at a computer near you. See you next week, guys.